Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Massospondylus and some dinosaur news. But before we get to the news, we want to make our announcement that we mentioned last week. We've just launched a Patreon campaign, and if you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a platform where content creators like us go to ask for donations so that we can buy better equipment or fund other elements of our project. Since you're listening to this podcast, you know that Garrett and I are big dinosaur enthusiasts, and we create weekly podcasts about dinosaur species, dinosaur news, dinosaur media, basically all things dinosaur, and we like to interview paleontologists, artists, writers, and anyone connected with dinosaurs as often as we can. And we've been lucky enough to have listeners in all 50 states in the U.S. and over 100 countries worldwide. We're up to over 75,000 downloads, which is amazing, and we really appreciate having your support, and we really enjoy interacting with you through email and Twitter, Facebook, Google, all the different social media channels that we're on. It's been really great. But we want to take this to the next level, and so Patreon would allow us to do that. And it's a platform similar to Kickstarter in that we have a goal that we set, and we ask for some support, but it's ongoing instead of a final end date. Garrett and I have just launched our page, which explains everything in detail and has a short little video featuring some of our favorite dinosaur memorabilia. I don't want to spoil it too much, but look out for some awesome puppets. And replicas. And the way that Patreon works is that we set up goals. Supporters can pledge a dollar or more a month, and then if we reach certain goals, then we get to do more things with our dinosaur podcast. And our first goal is to get some better equipment so that we can have some higher quality audio, especially with our interview guests. We also want to subscribe to some more scientific journals because sometimes we can't get in and read the real text, and it becomes kind of difficult to tell what exactly the scientists meant when they were writing because you get paraphrased versions from different reporters, so you can't necessarily tell. It depends what the reporter is thinking. And then we have another goal to make more content, more episodes, for instance, so all of that could be possible. And in exchange for your support, we offer different levels of rewards. So at the $1 level, we'll have a special exclusive activity feed where we'll post some stuff behind the scenes and let you know ahead of time who we're talking to next and which dinosaurs we'll be covering. And you can also get to know other dinosaur enthusiasts who listen to the podcast. We also offer some higher tier rewards, and you can check that out in more detail on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash I know dino and we will be sure to post a link on our site as well so just to reiterate the podcast will still remain free but if you have enjoyed our podcast so far this would be an awesome way to show your support and now on to the news in an abandoned quarry in Lower Saxony, Germany, scientists have found a long trail of footprints, about 90 footprints over 164 feet or 50 meters. The tracks are 145 million years old, made by a sauropod, and according to Benjamin Einglick, who's leading the excavation, quote, We don't have a complete skeleton for a dinosaur this big from this time period. That means it's a species we haven't seen before from this era, end quote. And based on the footprint impressions, which are 17 inches deep and 4 feet across, scientists think that the sauropod weighed up to 30 tons. So that'll be exciting if and when they figure out which sauropod it was. I really like sauropods, so it's good to know that there's still more being discovered. Also in the news is an article that's not about dinosaurs, but it's very related to them because it's about what they ate. And it's an article titled... Montsecia, an ancient aquatic angiosperm, which is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Bernard Gomez and others. It's also summarized really well in Forbes by Shana Montanari, who we've mentioned before on the podcast because she typically does a good job summarizing these heavy articles. And since we're not big into botany, typically on this podcast, it really helps to get a good summary. In this case, the species is a fully aquatic plant and it was around in freshwater lakes about 130 million years ago. But what makes it interesting is that it had an angiosperm. Typically, 
plants that have angiosperms in modern times have flowers, but this one actually didn't have flowers, which is another kind of interesting piece to it. So like I mentioned, dinosaurs were impacted by the plant development and evolution while they were on Earth. And there was definitely some interaction between the two, because how could there not be? But in recent years, some scientists have been looking a little more critically at just how much they co-evolved. And Shana points to an article titled, Did Dinosaurs Invent Flowers? Dinosaur Angiosperm Co-Evolution Revisited, where they looked at a bunch of these old plants to kind of see if there was a link between angiosperm development and the interaction between dinosaurs at the time. But they couldn't really find any correlations to support the hypothesis that dinosaurs were causing any of these origins of angiosperms. But they did mention that the dinosaur-angiosperm interactions, especially in the late Cretaceous, which is really the main time they were around, probably led to some co-evolutionary interactions. So you see that a lot with birds. It's kind of funny since you don't really think of dinosaurs as birds, but birds have a lot of these evolutions specifically for different flower types. You know, you see like hummingbirds with the real long bills and things like that. So it wouldn't be surprising to think that dinosaurs evolved along with plants, just like their modern counterparts do. There is a big question of where these first angiosperms developed and then how dinosaurs interacted with them afterwards. It's interesting that this new early example was fully aquatic and it appeared that it even pollinated while it was in the water as well which, according to the Forbes article, only occurs in less than 5% of aquatic flowering plants. It's a little bit surprising to me because I tend to wonder how do the other ones pollinate if they're aquatic and they don't do it in the water. I guess they must only pollinate when they're the ones on the banks of shores or something. I don't know. Interesting. But <laughs> this is a especially interesting specimen because it has the fruit that's characteristic of angiosperms. And it's just a single seed, but it's upside down compared to how the seeds are oriented in most angiosperm plants. But this plant actually didn't have any flowers, so it appears that flowers might have been some later evolution or maybe coming down a different lineage of plants. It's hard to say. Michael Demick, who teaches anatomical sciences at Stony Brook University in New York, has been collecting bones from the Bighorn Basin in Montana. This area is where John Ostrom found the Talon of Deinonychus in 1964. Demick so far has found a previously unknown mammal, crocodile, and dinosaur. And since 2007, he's been on five digs over the last five summers and found about 300 bones. Many of the bones are of young dinosaurs, and one is of an acrocanthosaurus bone, which before had only been found in Texas and Oklahoma. The theory is that this area flooded, which buried a lot of the bones. And Demick said he plans to continue excavating the area, so it be interesting to see what else he finds. Next, in Australia's Lightning Ridge, there's a new fossil hunting expedition with a team from Australian Geographic and Australian Opal Center. They're working together to find new dinosaur species in Australia. Currently, there's less than 20 types, and so far a lot of fossils have been found, and many of them have been opalized, and they're gem quality, so that's pretty cool. Of the dinosaurs found so far in Australia, many of them have similarities with dinosaurs found in South America, Antarctica, and Africa. Field Station Dinosaurs in Secaucus, New Jersey, which we've talked about a few times on this podcast, is set to leave New Jersey after Labor Day to make room for a high school. Currently, the plan is to put the dinosaurs in storage, but Guy Giselle from Derby, Kansas, who we've also mentioned in this podcast before, he plans to create this epic dinosaur museum slash theme park in Kansas. He's in talks to move the dinosaurs to Derby, Kansas, but that's still up in the air. In Sogus, Massachusetts, the owner of MT Realty, Michael Touchette, is purchasing the orange T-Rex that has stood over the Sogus Highway for the past 50 years. The dinosaur will be moved to a new area, though it's not clear yet where it will go, and Touchette said he will be speaking at a town meeting about where to put the dinosaur. And for people who may not be familiar with this T-Rex, it's about 12 feet tall, and it will stay in its spot overlooking the highway until next year. In Yamoto City in Japan, a new dinosaur-themed restaurant is opening called Dinosaur Ancient Times Restaurant and Bar. Apparently you can enter via a T-Rex's mouth and hear lots of dinosaur sounds. There are 20 life-size dinosaurs in the restaurant, including some animatronic ones. Two of the dinosaurs also have saddles, so you can ride them. And dinosaurs in the restaurant include Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, Stegosaurus, and T-Rex. Must be a really big restaurant. 
In Iowa, Harold and Kay Whipple, who are wood carvers, are making wooden dinosaurs with moving parts and donating them to a nearby children's hospital, a medical center, and Ronald McDonald House. Due to privacy rules, the couple is not allowed to meet the children who play with the dinosaur toys, but they make about 25 toys each month, and I think that's really nice of them. That makes those toys extra special. There's a new short online game that's free called Anatomically Incorrect Dinosaurs, created by Natalie Lawhead. And in the game, you play an archaeologist and you have to reassemble dinosaurs from their parts. The game's free to download and we'll post a link. And in, um, in one of the screenshots, it shows a dinosaur with, I think, arms coming out of its shoulders or its stomach or something a little bit strange. So you can, it seems like you can do anything with them. And last, this isn't too dinosaur related, but Madden made a short five minute movie for the video game Madden NFL 16, which is coming out soon. And the video has almost nothing to do with the game, but it is very action packed and it's about five minutes long. And at the four minute, 19 second mark, you can see a T-Rex roaring and charging. So we'll post the link in case you're interested in watching that. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Massospondylus which was requested from Zach via email, so thanks Zach. Massospondylus lived in the early Jurassic. The type species is Massospondylus carinatus. There have been seven species named in the last 150 years, but only two of the species are still valid. Fossils have been found in South Africa, Lesotho, and Zimbabwe. Other fossils originally thought to be Massospondylus, but are now other species, were found in Arizona, India, and Argentina. Richard Owen described this dinosaur first in 1854, based on fossils found in South Africa, and it was one of the first dinosaurs named. Originally, Owen didn't think that Massospondylus bones were dinosaur bones. He thought they were large, extinct carnivorous reptiles related to lizards, chameleons, and iguanas. Joseph Millard Orpin found 56 bones, including vertebrae from the neck, back, and tail, shoulder blade, humerus, partial pelvis, femur, tibia, and bones from the hands and feet in 1853 in South Africa, and then donated them to the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons in London. The bones were disarticulated, so it was hard to tell if they all came from the same species. Unfortunately, all those fossils were destroyed on May 10th, 1941, when a German bomb hit the Hunterian Museum. Eighty partial skeletons and four skulls have been found in South Africa, Lesotho, and Zimbabwe. A skull in Arizona was found in 1985 that was thought to be Massospondylus. It was 25% larger than other skulls found, but a recent study identified it as a new genus, Cerasaurus. Fossils were also found in Argentina that were thought to be Massospondylus, but they were renamed to Adiopaposaurus in 2009. Other former species include Massospondylus browni, named in 1895, Massospondylus harrisi, named in 1911, Massospondylus hislopi, named in 1890, Massospondylus huni, named in 1981, Massospondylus rossi, named in 1890, and Massospondylus schwartzi, named in 1924. Massospondylus browni, harrisi, and schwartzi were found in South Africa, but it's all fragmentary material, so it's regarded as indeterminate. Massospondylus hislopi and rossi were found in India, and hislopi is indeterminate, but rossi may be actually a theropod. Massospondylus huni was a combination of Lufengosaurus and Massospondylus. They were thought to be synonyms, but this is no longer accepted. But the second valid species that's still considered valid of Massospondylus is Massospondylus collie, which was named in 2009 based on a partial skull from South Africa from the same time and area as Massospondylus carinatus, but they have a slightly different brain case. So it's considered a valid species as a second species as of 2014. Other dubious synonymous or junior synonyms of Massospondylus include Leptospondylus, Pachyspondylus, Aristosaurus, Dromicosaurus, and Portolatosaurus. Named in 1894, but according to paleontologist Broom in 1911, quote, originally most of the skeleton was in the rock, and it was regarded by the farmers as the skeleton of a bushman, but it is said to have been destroyed through fear that a bushman skeleton in the rock might tend to weaken the religious belief of the rising generation. Another synonym is Ignavusaurus. Massospondylus was 13 to 20 feet or 4 to 6 meters long, had a long neck and tail, a small head, a slender body, and had sharp, long thumb claws that it used either to help eat or possibly in defense. It had tiny fourth and fifth digits, so its forepaws looked lopsided. It weighed about 2,200 pounds or 1,000 kilograms, and it was 
about three feet or one meter tall. It's similar to the dinosaur Plateosaurus, which, as a side note, interestingly, in a 2005 study, they found that Plateosaurus had growth patterns based on environmental factors when in favorable climate or around lots of food, it grew fast, which is known as developmental plasticity. But this is not seen in other dinosaurs, including Massospondylus. One study actually found that Massospondylus grew steadily, and another found that it grew a maximum of 76 pounds, or 34.6 kilograms per year, and grew until about age 15. So it grew steadily throughout its life. It also had air sacs, like birds. Its forelimbs were half the length of hind limbs, but were still powerful. It was originally thought to be quadrupedal, but a 2007 study found that it was actually bipedal. And the study found that Massospondylus may have used its short arm to swat at predators in defense, combat with each other, or help with feeding. Its arms would have been too short to reach its mouth, though. It had a limited range of motion, so it would not have been able to be quadrupedal. Its hand could not rotate to face downwards, and its forelimbs could not swing in a way similar to its hind limbs. Its thumb claws could have been used for digging, grooming, stripping plants, and fighting. 2007 papers support Massospondylus as a family. Massospondylidae. And they're also considered a sauropodomorph. But knowledge of early sauropodomorphs keeps changing. So in addition to being a sauropodomorph, Massospondylus was an herbivore and a platyosaurid, which is a heavy, thick-limbed herbivore. Interestingly, sauropodomorphs link later sauropods to bipedal saurischians. Massospondylus was probably an herbivore, though early sauropodomorphs may have been omnivores. Until the 1980s, paleontologists thought that sauropodomorphs, like Massospondylus, may have been carnivorous, but now they think it could have been herbivores or omnivores due to their jaw articulation, according to a 2004 study by Galton and Upchurch. In 2001, paleontologists said that they may have eaten small prey or carrion. Gastroliths have also been found with three Massospondylus fossils in Zimbabwe. Originally, scientists thought that these gastroliths helped aid in digestion since they couldn't chew, but in 2007, wings and sander showed that there was a large amount of polished stones, which, quote, precluded a use as an effective gastric mill in most non-theropod dinosaurs. So they were saying that sauropods didn't use gastroliths, and they found that actually a theropod, Lewinhanosaurus, used gastroliths, which is interesting. Yeah, I wonder how they ended up with gastroliths near that fossil if they weren't using them as gastroliths. <laughs> Massospondylus had two types of teeth. They had small pointed teeth like theropods in the front of the mouth and spatulate teeth in the rear of their mouth, which is why there's a lot of debate over its diet. They possibly had cheeks. They also possibly had an overbite. Some scientists think that they even had a beak, but this seems unlikely. The number of teeth they had varies depending on a skull size. The largest one has 26 teeth on each side of its lower jaw. It's not clear what predators went after Massospondylus. Most theropods from the same time and place, such as Megapnosaurus, were smaller than Massospondylus, and they may have slashed quickly to wear down their prey, but Massospondylus would have used its foot claws to protect itself. Another potential predator was the theropod Dracovinator, which was 20 feet or 6 meters long. In 1976, six to seven Massospondylus eggs, six inches or 15 centimeters long, were found in South Africa by James Kitching, but it took 30 years to start the extraction. They are the oldest known dinosaur embryos found so far. It took five years to excavate the eggs, and Kitching decided he didn't have the resources to remove the fossil from the egg rock without hurting the bones, so he focused on the egg shells and found that they were similar to crocodiles and birds. In 1979, he wrote a preliminary report and found a skull that was well-preserved. It was 10 millimeters from ear to ear, and he suggested that one of the eggs had hatched. But because the embryos couldn't be well-studied at the time, people debated whether they were actually massospondylus or even dinosaur eggs. A 2002 study said that they were more crocodilian than dinosaurian. But in 2004, Rees and Scott from the University of Toronto studied the eggs with CAT scans. Still, the scans were inconclusive because it was too hard to distinguish the rock from the bone. Scott spent a year preparing the eggs using tiny air-driven jackhammers and thin needles to remove the rock and then looked at the eggs under a high-powered microscope and found that there were, yes, two dinosaur embryos in the fetal position. But it was still hard to analyze the eggs. The femur was only 1.4 millimeters in diameter. But at least it confirmed that the eggs were massospondylus, and the findings were published in 2005. Eventually, those eggs were flown to Grenoble to be examined with a CT scan at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. Until CT scanning came about, the X-ray resolution needed was too high. Six microns, so only a few places in the world could do it. 
In 2014, the team moved the eggs to this facility in Grenoble, but it will take a while to process all the information. They have about 1,000 gigabytes of information, and they'll be doing that at the University of Witwatersrand Virtual Paleontology Lab in Johannesburg. Additional findings were published in 2012, and they actually found 10 more egg clutches with up to 34 eggs in each clutch. They were found on four fossil horizons, so the nesting site may have been used multiple times. The nesting area was near a lake, and eggshells were thin, 0.1 millimeters, so they were probably partially buried in the substrate. There's no hints that Massospondylus made the nest, but the eggs were arranged in tight rows, so they were probably pushed there. The eggs were probably near ready to hatch. They had large heads with short snouts and large eyes and a short neck. The forelimbs and high limbs, interestingly, were the same length, so Massospondylus may have been quadrupedal as babies and then bipedal as adults. There was no teeth and they couldn't move too much, so they would have had to be fed by their parents until they doubled in size, and scientists are guessing that they doubled in size before leaving the nest based on footprint sizes. Massospondylus mothers would have been too large to incubate the eggs, so that's why they probably clustered them into the tight rows. The nests don't have any bowl-shaped depressions or signs of nest construction, but it may have been a communal nesting site because there's strength in numbers to defend the eggs. The lake near the nest often flooded. It was a seasonal cycle, so it was probably bad timing that resulted in the eggs that paleontologists found. Again, this is the oldest known dinosaur group nesting site. Others known are 100 million years younger, and this behavior shows complex reproductive behavior. So again, Massospondylus is a sauropodomorph, and sauropodomorphs were large herbivores. Sauropodomorpha means lizard feet forms. Frederick von Huhn in 1932 established this suborder and broke it into two groups, prosauropoda and sauropoda. There's no gaps between prosauropod and sauropod lineages, and recent cladistic analyses suggest the clad prosauropoda is a junior synonym of platyosauridae. This is because there's no evidence that it's easier to reduce digits during evolution, and prosauropods had a smaller outer toe on the hind feet compared to sauropods. There's four families in this group, Platosauridae, Anchisauridae, Massospindylidae, and Melanorosauridae. They're found on most continents, and they're some of the world's oldest known dinosaur bones. Most lived in Europe. They've also been found in Asia and the Americas, and some even found in Madagascar. They were probably herbivores with muscular legs to stand on two feet and eat tall vegetation. They probably traveled in groups. They could have been both quadrupedal and bipedal. Their forelimbs were about half the length of their hind limbs, and their mouths were like nutcrackers, though they probably couldn't chew. Instead, they may have had these gastric mills in their stomach walls. As mentioned earlier, these would have been stones embedded that grind food, but they were inefficient, which is probably why this group went extinct. They had tiny skulls, and they had thumb claws that they used for defense, and they had large nostrils, and were possibly cathomeral. And our fun fact of the day relates back to my discussion about angiosperms and plants. And even though dinosaurs probably weren't involved with the rise of angiosperms, it's likely that high atmospheric carbon dioxide levels may have spurred the development of angiosperm and their rapid expansion across the planet. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Once again, Garrett and I have launched a Patreon page, and if you would like to support us and help us reach our first goal of getting some better equipment so we have higher quality audio of our podcast episodes and our interviews, then please visit patreon.com slash I Know Dino. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.